what we're going to be doing this afternoon is, is just having a look at a few things which, as you might guess, are in the British Museum in London that are linked in some way to events that we read of in the Bible. And it, it's actually it's quite a fascinating thing, really, that the British Museum only really exists because of the Bible. You might say, what are you talking about? But the original collection that the British Museum was founded from, uh, and when the British Museum was first founded, its primary aim was to go into what we would now know as the Middle East, and to excavate sites of biblical significance. Uh, there was a great interest in the 1800s around uh, areas and places and people of the Bible and uh, what could be found to show that they existed. Now, it's interesting looking at that timeline because it was only really in the 1800s that archaeology really became a thing. Um, before then, yeah, there might well have been old ruins of things, but, but no great interest in the same way as there was then, and in some way continues to be now. And it's also interesting to look at people that believe in the Bible, and at the same time that more and more things are being discovered that give evidence of the truth of the Bible, belief in the Bible is declining. I find that very interesting. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to that point a, a few times this afternoon. Because some people, when they, if they read the Bible at all, if they think about the Bible, say, well, if there's a God, why doesn't he just prove that he exists? A great big sign in the sky, or, or something that we, we can't um, deny the existence of a God. If you actually open the pages of the Bible and begin to read it, you soon understand why. Because there is something that is very important that God says is important to him all the way through the pages, almost from the first chapter to the last, and that's faith. And we'll come to faith again at the end of the talk, but what we're going to look at here is evidence. I wouldn't go as far as to say proof. I think when you combine things together, it becomes compelling evidence. But God intentionally, I believe, hasn't given us a sign in the sky because he wants us to find these things out and develop our own understanding. So ju just um, a little bit about how this talk came into being. Um, Hall Green in Birmingham, uh, we have a meeting which is the same as this. And we're very blessed to have lots of children. Um, and our senior CYC, or youth group, we decided to have a tour to the British Museum um, to show the kids the uh, things that were there. There's the Motley crew, um, 37 children. Um, there were th this is just the senior CYC. So 37 <coughs> arrived and 37 left, which in its own <laughs> Along the way was a bit of a miracle, um, but, but had a very, very interesting day. Uh, and we, we looked in groups at a number of time periods, biblical time periods, all in the Old Testament, uh, and we went around and looked at some of the exhibits. And before we went, we had a series of talks, which this is most of them combined, um, but quite a bit of it taken out. Um, so this is a kind of condensed version of what we went through with the teenagers before uh, we went down on this trip to the British Museum. And we started off right near the beginning of the Bible, in early Genesis, uh, and, and we progressed through. And you might think, well, that's such a long time ago in history that you're not really going to find an awful lot, even in the British Museum, to um, support the early chapters of Genesis. But actually you can. Um, and actually you can go back as far as Genesis chapter 3, the third chapter of the Bible. And there is something in the British Museum that gives us evidence 
of the things that we read in Genesis 3. Now we're not going to go through Genesis 3 because it's actually a very well-known story in the Bible of Adam and Eve and the temptation. But what I'd like to put on the screen, hopefully you can see it, is a seal. Now, a seal, not the small furry animal, um, but the seals were cylinders, usually about this big, made of stone. And they had carvings on the cylinders, which would be rolled into clay to make an impression. And, and they were used in ancient times, and again, to, to an extent, are still used and have continued to be used through history to seal documents, to prove that things were from individuals. Individuals tended to have their own seal or a family seal. We might think of kind of medieval England and the king's seal and the signet ring to seal in the wax. It's the same idea, but, but back then it was these uh, stone cylinders and they marked into clay. And this is a seal that dates back 2,300 years. So, four, uh, BC, so 4,300 years old, which, which puts it as one of the oldest exhibits in the British Museum. Um, and in biblical terms, that's 200 years before Abraham, um, who we read of later on in Genesis. Um, and only, depending on when you date these things, and we'll come on to that in a minute, it's quite problematic, but probably only a few hundred years after the reading that we read of the Flood. And what it depicts, again I'm unsure as to how easily you can see this, but I'll try and describe it. What it depicts, when you can see on the left hand side is the impression it makes on the clay, the right hand side is the seal itself. In the middle, you can hopefully make out a tree. Um, there's a tree, and it has seven branches which is quite interesting. Um, and either side of the tree, there are two people. One we can tell is a man, and one a woman. And the woman has her hand stretched out towards the tree, and behind them is a serpent, a snake. Um, you can see behind both of them because that's where the scene joins. And again, if you know your Bible, you automatically think of Genesis 3 because this is a very, very uh, strong depiction, I think, of the account that we read of Adam and Eve in the garden, Eve taking the fruit from the tree after being tempted by the serpent. And when it was found, back in the 1800s, it was named the Temptation Seal. Um, and, and it actually made, uh, as quite a few of these things did, the front page of the newspapers when these things were found, evidence of things recorded in the Bible. Now again, just an observation, when we went to the British Museum and we, we took the kid round and we came to the cabinet that has the seal in, that there's a little piece next to each of the exhibits. And the piece next to this one read something along the lines of, when first discovered in the 1800s, people linked it to the account of Adam and Eve in the Bible, but now we've come to realise that it's probably just a depiction of a feast. <laughs> and, and I think that kind of encapsulates some of the way that people think now. And it's almost, well, we can't really believe the Bible, can we? So what else could it be? Now, what, what I'd like to hopefully do is build a bit of a picture this afternoon to show that you can't do that all the time. You can't keep doing that and be credible. When evidence mounts up and mounts up and mounts up, and we are not even scratching the surface this afternoon, I think that approach becomes a little difficult to sustain in all seriousness. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to the next one. Now, has anyone ever heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh? Okay, we've got some nodding heads. You don't often get that. Um, so, the Epic of Gilgamesh is one of, if not the oldest story that is known to exist. Um, on the left hand side, we have a tablet that dates back to 1700 BC. Again, in Bible times, that's about when Israel was in Egypt. Um, and the one on the right hand side, which is another fragment of the same story, is um, 
700 BC, around the time of Hezekiah in the Bible. But it was uh, an ancient Assyrian story, and, and I'm a bit sad I actually got a copy of it and found it on eBay. Um, and there's a transcript of, there's a number of tablets that have been found of this same story, and it's quite interesting because we often think of storytelling as maybe something that the Greeks invented and the, the epics of the Greeks, Homer, the Iliad, all that kind of thing. But it goes much further back. They themselves drew inspiration from some of these writings. And they're in the same vein. They're fantastical stories. So the plot of the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's about a king called Gilgamesh or Gilgamesh. Um, and he's a ruler of a city-state in what we, we would now know as Iraq. And he goes on this epic journey. And that's what the, the, the story is all about. It's the journey that he goes through. And he wants to become a god. He wants to be immortal. And this is his journey to immortality. And he's told of a man um, called Utnapishtim who had survived a flood. And he himself had become a god because he had survived this flood. So Gilgamesh goes in search for Utnapishtim and he goes through a series of trials similar to the type of things that Hercules would have gone through in, in the Greek myths. He fights the winged bull of heaven. Um, there is a bull with wings that's about the size of this hall. Um, he manages to defeat it. Um, he comes across other fantastical creatures. There is nothing in this book that you would read and go, oh yes, that's got the ring of truth. It's an obvious we would now know story, or fable, or uh, myth. But why is it of interest to us? Well, you, you probably noticed the link to someone who had survived a flood, this is the and we, we read as our reading part of the biblical account of Noah and the flood. Now, before we look at why these two things can be compared, just have a think about, if you've read your Bible, if you've read through... Genesis 6 to 8, and you read of the account of Noah. Is there anything fantastical? Yes, there's a global flood. But are there mythical beasts? Are there superhuman feats? Are there things that we know just couldn't happen? The Bible doesn't have those things, and it's almost unique because of it in ancient, with ancient writing. Most ancient writing is through the lens and the culture of the time. The Bible is very different. The Bible tells us usually warts and all about the characters. If we were to spend time on it this afternoon, we could look at the fact that Moses, although he's recorded as being a very faithful man, gets drunk. And he, he does bad things. It's a, a balanced approach. And the Bible takes us all the way through. Abraham, who was a man of great faith, pretended that his wife was his sister so that he didn't get into trouble with the Pharaoh. He, he did other things that, that wouldn't have been a flattering um, reflection of him and his character, but they were recorded. So, on to the Epic of Gilgamesh. We, we read um, some verses from Genesis chapter 8, and I'd just like you to have those in front of you as I read part of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, and we remember we read from verse 4 to verse 14 of Genesis chapter 8. So just scan down that as I read um, from this. And these are the tablets that you can see on the screen. On the mountain of Nemush, the boat ran aground. The Mount Nemush held the boat fast, allowed it no motion. The seventh day when it came, I brought out a dove. I let it loose, off went the dove, but then it returned. There was no place to land, so it came back to me. I brought out a swallow, I let it loose, off went the swallow, but it returned. There was no place to land, it came back to me. I brought out a raven, I let it loose, off went the raven. It saw the water proceeding, finding food, it was swooping and strutting and did not come back to me. I brought out an offering to the four winds and made sacrifice, incense I placed on the peak of the mountain. Now this is Utnapishtim talking to Gilgamesh of his survival of the flood. But what striking detail we have 
from the record in Genesis. We've got the ark arriving on the top of a mountain. We've got the raven. We've got the dove. Uh, if we read a little bit further on Genesis chapter 8, we read that Noah gives a sacrifice. All of these things are there in Genesis and are there in type in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And, and it's a bit like the, you know, the game of Chinese Whispers. So you start out with something, and if I whispered in your ear and it went all the way through the audience, came out the other end, it might resemble what I've begun with, but it's unlikely to be exactly the same. And that's the principle, I believe, that's at work here. Here we have in Genesis a believable record of an event that happened. Here we have a story which has developed feet and legs and arms over time, but has elements of that story still there. And actually we could spend all evening just looking at other things like that from the Bible, uh, because there are lots and lots of them. It goes through Greek mythology, Roman mythology, goes into uh, Assyrian beliefs, all sorts of things, Zoroastrianism. There are roots back to, quite often, Genesis, the beginnings. And I found that quite incredible. So the Epic of Gilgamesh is there in the British Museum, both of those. The one on the left-hand side is um, quite a well-known exhibit now. Uh, it was featured last year. I think Radio 4 featured it as one of the most important artefacts that we've ever discovered. Uh, they were doing this series because it was showing the beginnings of culture and language and storytelling. I think it's more interesting because of what it tells us about the biblical record and the ideas that are in the Bible, which permeate through other writings and civilizations. But it wasn't just this story. There are many flood stories all over the world. Um, another one in the British Museum, again, it goes back to um, uh, Babylon this time. Um, the one on the left-hand side, your left-hand side, was uh, it's known as the Atrasis Epic. Um, and it's a similar type of story, different characters, but again, a worldwide flood, things such as the Ark, and the Ark is actually described on the, on the right-hand side. An ark is described with very similar dimensions to the one in Genesis. So again, you have these echoes coming through of what we read in the Bible. Okay, moving on in biblical time, but still remaining in Genesis, we come to Abraham. And Abraham, as we mentioned before, was one of the great men of faith that the Bible talks to us about. And that picture there is uh, a photo of a place in Iraq known as Ur of the Chaldees. And again, in the, this is in the 1800s, there was an expedition sent by the British Museum and the University Museum in Pennsylvania. They joined together and they sent an archaeologist, a man called Leonard Woolley, out to uh, Iraq. It wasn't called Iraq then. Um, but they went out to the desert to excavate this place where the locals said there was a story that an ancient civilization had lived there. So off they went, and this is what they first discovered. Um, hopefully you can see that. It's a, quite a, an impressive and imposing structure. It's known as a ziggurat, um, and it's a temple. It's the temple to the moon goddess of Ur of the Chaldees. Now in the 1800s, people have begun to, some people have begun to doubt the accuracy of the Bible. And one thing that had been said was, well, there's lots of places in the Bible that we only read about in the Bible, we don't know from anywhere else. And Ur of the Chaldees was one of those. If we look at Genesis chapter 11, over a couple of pages, at the end of Genesis chapter 11, we're introduced to Abraham, um, and in verse uh, 27, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begat Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And again in verse 31, towards the end of that verse, they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan. And we have this account of Abram who was 
brought out of this place, told to leave it by God and to go somewhere that God would tell them. And they discovered Ur of the Chaldees. And again, it was front page news. That's actually a cutting from the Times, a picture of Sir Leonard Willey and his wife, uh, and the headline, Archaeologist Returns from Ur, and underneath it, the University of Pennsylvania scientists confirm biblical truth. You would not see that today, would you, on the front of a national newspaper? And the account goes on to say that they found this place. There's two pictures there. One, the, the excavation of the, uh, the ziggurat that had begun. Um, and on the left-hand side, you've got a picture of Sir Leonard Willey bringing out some artefacts <coughs> that you can actually see in the British Museum from Ur of the Chaldees. The one that he's got there is a harp. And it was from something that we'll look at in a minute, from uh, one of the great discoveries in Ur that tells us a lot about the culture of the time. And what they found is that Ur of the Chaldees wasn't just some backwater. It was a thriving and important commercial centre, possibly at its point the most powerful city for many, many miles around. Very important, very wealthy, lots of culture. And um, hopefully this next bit will work. Um, there's a short video of a, a, a mock-up, um, a digital um, mock-up of a fly-through of the Colby's. Let's just see if this works. Okay. So I'll talk you through it just in case you can't see it. So what we're seeing here is uh, lots of uh, rivers with a, a city, a very complex city, next to it, which is Ur of the Chaldees, and in the centre of the city was that ziggurat that we saw. Um, it shows that these, these houses were two and three storey. Uh, they used to sleep on the roof because it was much cooler to do so. Uh, this is in the scorching heat of, of the, uh, the Middle East. And they've discovered a lot about the people that lived there. They've discovered these buildings, they've been able to reconstruct them, they have these tiny windows because again of the heat. Um, they were built quite big, thick clay walls, um, and that again was so that they remained cool on the inside. They discovered evidence of marketplaces, of places of work, of government buildings which had receipts uh, of transactions that had gone on. Um, there was incredible jewellery, and we'll look at some of it in a minute, and works of art. Uh, there was the houses themselves were not simple mud huts. They had central courtyards. They had two, sometimes three storeys. They had water brought into them. They had sanitation. But this was a, an advanced civilization, And the Bible tells us that. It tells us that Abraham had great faith because he left all of this behind. And he went out into the middle of nowhere, which is where God had told him to do. Now that would require great faith. Again, we pan around the city, uh, and, and around the city there was this great um, <coughs> wealth of industry, which actually hasn't changed an awful lot over the years. If you go to some of the areas in modern-day Iraq, they have a similar life to what they would have had there, with fishing, with commerce, in very, um, in our day, simple ways but in its own way, a very rich culture. So that, that's a, a taste of maybe what Ur of the Chaldees would have been like. So in the British Museum, we've got a number of things. There's a whole room dedicated to Ur of the Chaldees, and they are the things that Sir Leonard Woolley had found on that excavation. So a lot of them came back to the British Museum, some of them went to the University of Pennsylvania in America. And this here is known as the standard of Ur. Uh, just a small piece of trivia that you might find interesting. One of the people that accompanied them on this and many other digs was Agatha Christie. He was a great friend of Sir Leonard Woolley's wife. Um, and actually some of their digs in Egypt inspired um, some of her stories. There you go. So the standard of Ur, again, don't know how much of the detail you can see. It's not a huge piece, so it's probably about this big, um, and it's made of lapis lazuli, which is this wonderful deep 
kind of iridescent blue, um, and ivory. And it depicts two scenes, one either side. Uh, one of peace, uh, sorry, one of war, and then one of peace. Um, and it was found in uh, a funerary pit of one of the queens that had reigned in her of the Corkies. And it dates back to 2500 BC. Now that's several hundred years before the time of Abraham. So Abraham was living in a city that had been important for a long time. That, that was <coughs> well on the map when he was there. And we know that Abraham was a wealthy man in Ur of the Colchis. So he would have had a lot of those comforts that we saw. Now we mentioned this death pit. Um, the, the, a lot of the exhibits in the British Museum, we've got one on the left, it's known as the Ram in the Thicket. Again, it shows how the mind worked when they discovered these things. They went straight to an account in the Bible. Um, now this account in the Bible actually was after then, so it can't really relate, but interesting nonetheless that that was the immediate link. Uh, we've got a ram um, standing there on um, a bush or a tree. Uh, and there was, there was two of these. One is in the British Museum and one is in this University of Pennsylvania Museum. We saw a couple of slides ago, Leonard Willey holding this harp. Um, that's the head. Well, you can't really see it very well. It's a shame because it's, it's amazing. The head of the harp, the harp is a bull, which is solid gold um, and of great detail. Um, and again, on the top left hand side of the inset, there is the headdress worn by the queen who was in this death pit. Again, it tells us a little bit about the culture that would have been there in Ur of the Colchis, because the queen there was also the high priestess of that ziggurat, of the temple. Uh, and she was almost seen as a god. So she wasn't just obeyed, she was worshipped. And when she died, um, she was put in this um, great sarcophagus. You might be able to see that white blob in the top right-hand corner. This is an artist's impression of what the pit would have been like that they excavated. And surrounding it were all her servants and household, and oxen and all sorts of things, all her wealth. And they were all given poison so that they died too. And that shows you the type of beliefs that would have been around. That they thought that all of these things would be needed in the next life. Similar to the ancient Egyptians thought the same thing. And that's where Abraham grew up. Okay, moving on. Um, again, still remaining partially in Genesis, but partially in Exodus now, looking at ancient Egypt. And, and it's one of the most exciting, I think, rooms in the British Museum, is when you go into the, um, the room with all the big Egyptian sculptures. <coughs> uh, it, I find it spine tingling because you're looking upon some of the things that people in the Bible would have seen. And, and that, to me, is incredible. You're walking past statues that Moses would have walked past, that Joseph would have seen. And it span, they span thousands of years, the things in, in this particular room. And it's probably one of the biggest links in the Bible between um, Egypt and Israel, but there are many through the Bible. There's lots of dealings between Egypt and Israel. But when people think of the Bible in Egypt, they automatically, I think, go to the time of the Exodus. And it's one of the things that scholars have looked at over many years as to, okay, how do we match up the pharaohs that we've discovered, evidence of, and uh, the accounts in Genesis? Now, a warning here. When we get past certain times in ancient history, Dating things become very, very difficult indeed. Because they didn't keep records in quite the same way as we did. They weren't as obsessed uh, as we are in the order of things and the dates of things. So when you go past about 400, 500 BC, beyond there is, is quite difficult, but not impossible. So what I'd like to just put forward is, is ideas, and they can only really be ideas, of the pharaohs that may have been around at the time of the Exodus of Egypt. And this is the kind of 
general consensus of scholars. Um, so it's not any work I've done, but it's the general consensus. There is disagreement, but again, um, for the purposes of this evening, it's more to see what is there of those times. Now, we think of the time of the Exodus, maybe we, we've seen the, um, the film with Charlton Heston, or maybe it's the, the later cartoon, Prince of Egypt, uh, and it gives us a fairly condensed idea of the time that would have passed, because Moses was 40 when he fled Egypt, he was 80 when he returned back to Egypt, to then lead the children of Israel out in the Exodus. That's a huge time span. And there aren't many pharaohs that reign for that length of time. So in all likelihood, there would have been quite a number of pharaohs around the time of Moses. And these are the most likely. So um, the pharaoh who killed the Hebrew children, we begin in, in Exodus 1 and we read that this Pharaoh was concerned by the growth of this, uh, these people, the, the Hebrews. And he decreed that all the boys were to be killed. And that is likely to have been Anamhotep I. And we'll go through these in a minute and, and maybe establish some of the reasons why scholars think these are the ones. We then have, uh, again, early in Exodus, uh, Moses is drawn out of the water, he's put into the water by um, his sister on the order of his parents um, to escape being killed, and he's drawn out by the daughter of the Pharaoh. Now it's possible, some would say likely, that we know who that person was, um, Hatshepsut. Uh, again, my pronunciation of ancient Egyptian names may not be right, but it's my best guess. But Hatshepsut is likely to have been the daughter who drew him out. And she becomes quite important later on because she's one of only a handful of women that rule Egypt. Because the uh, pharaoh at the time of Moses being in Midian, the I, who likely would have been someone that Moses grew up with, in their royal household, mm -hmm. and he died quite suddenly and left no apparent heir, and had should reigned for a period. And then we have the likely pharaoh of the Exodus, either Tutmos the second or Tutmos the third. Again, just a, a small point, but you notice the names of the pharaohs, Tutmos, or in some documents, Tutmoses, mm. Moses. Moses is Hebrew for drawn out of the water, because that's what he was. But there's a link to an Egyptian name, and maybe there's a clue as to why he was known by that name, and that name was acceptable in the Egyptian household as well as with the Hebrews. So let's go through these. So Amenhotep, the one who killed the Hebrew children, here in that great room in the British Museum, there is a... Um, a, a sculpture of him, Amenhotep I, uh, and this is likely to have been something that Moses would have seen. It's likely that he walked past it. It's likely that while he was in the palace that this was taken from. You, know, you can imagine the child Moses seeing these great statues, um, maybe playing hide and seek around them, who knows? But it gets my imagination going when you see things like that. Tutmos I, he was the one who, remember, was likely to be reigning while Moses was in Midian. Um, and he, he was uh, a warrior. He pushed into the land that we now know as Israel, into the Levant, and he expanded the borders of Egypt. Um, and he is also thought to be the first of the pharaohs to have a tomb in what's known now as the Valley of the Kings. Um, so, uh, again, an important man who built lots of things, and again, there's two heads of Tutmos I, either side of the, the doorway from the Great Court, going into British Museum's downstairs area with the sculptures of Egypt. So you're flanked by Tutmos I, who was likely to have been 
at least an acquaintance, if not a friend, of Moses. Incredible. Then we have Hatshepsut, who was that royal princess. She was the eldest daughter of Tutmos I. Um, and uh, she was part of the, the royal household and was the one that became a queen. And, and we have a number of things, again, all these things are in the British Museum. Um, there's, the middle one is a votary, so it's, it's almost got a, a prayer to one of the gods written on it. Um, and it's known uh, by her name being on there, at Sepulchre, her name is on there, that it was her. She would have had that as, as almost an ornament. Um, or an idol. The one on the right hand side is possibly her bed, which is quite incredible I find. Um, it, it's fragments of some furniture uh, and they know it was hers because um, something we'll see a little bit later when we look at Egyptian hieroglyphs. You can tell something that belongs to someone important because they draw a circle around the name Cartouche and the Cartouche of Hatshepsut was on this bed. Um, and it was unusual, as I said, for a woman to rule Egypt, but she did because of the sudden death um, of the previous pharaoh. Now, Tutmos II is, scholars believe, on consensus, the best op option for being the pharaoh of the Exodus. Um, now, Tutmos II, there isn't actually anything in the British Museum, the one on the right and he's actually in a museum in Berlin, and his mummy is in a, a, a museum in Egypt. And it's the mummy that you can see on the left hand side. But I thought it interesting to put that up on there, not to be gruesome, but it's the only pharaoh's mummy that has big cysts or boils. Remember what one of the plagues of Egypt was? Mm. Uh, and you can almost, you might not be able to see, you can see quite clearly on mine. Um, on his cheek there is a large boil um, and on his shoulder area there is another one and apparently there were a number over his body um, and again he's one that uh, died suddenly according to the records um, and took most the third took over from him but wasn't actually descended from him he was a uh, general in the army who just took on the title of took most the third and the III, there's a number of things in the British Museum that are from him. Um, actually, that picture on the left-hand side, one of the most impressive statues in that downstairs area is of Tutmos III from his throne room. So again, just going back to those dates and those potential links, um, we can see that some of the things that we can see down there in London um, are linked very closely to things that we're reading about in the book of Exodus. Now upstairs from there, um, there's it's just along the corridor from the area of the Colby's exhibit, there's a room that has a number of collections from the area of Israel. Um, and one of the things that it has is, is these, they're called the El Armana letters. Now they were written to um, Pharaoh, um, possibly, um, well, it was definitely written to Amenhotep III, who followed Tutmos III. Um, so he is after the Exodus, but almost immediately after the Exodus, and that's important because it's what these letters say. Now, these letters were written by um, the kings of cities, because that's really all they had. They didn't really have. Egypt had an empire, most of them just had city-states. And they were written from cities within what we would now call Israel. And it goes something like this. Dear Pharaoh, um, you're wonderful, amazing, incredible, uh, lots and lots of buttering up, you might call it. And then towards the end it says, well, these people that are called the Hapiri, which means the wanderers, the nomads, they started to attack us. Can you come and help? Now why would they write that to the Pharaoh? Because where had those people come from? They'd come out from Egypt. The Bible tells us they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They were nomads. They lived in tents. Hapiru, 
and on the linguist, but apparently there's a linguistic link from Hapiru to Hebrew. Um, and it means, in this case, a wandering people. So it's likely that these letters were written because of the events that we read about in the book of Joshua, where Joshua leads the people into the land of Israel and starts to conquer those city-states. And we think of the walls of Jericho coming down, that it's those nations at that time. Okay, uh, another one that's very well known this time, you'll probably have heard of this one, the Rosetta Stone. Um, and it's a very popular exhibit. It's one of the few that they've had to build a protective glass case around because people are so interested and, and, and want to touch it. Um, because this, this was a very important discovery. It, it was found in the late 1700s, 1799, um, by a, uh, a French soldier in the deserts in Egypt. Uh, and it dates back to the time of the Ptolemies. Now, the Ptolemies were descended really from the, they were part of the, the remnants of the Greek Empire. So after Alexander, the Greek Empire was split, the Ptolemies ruled in Egypt. And they took on the mantle of the pharaohs. Um, and they um, used the language of the Egyptians. And this is an important discovery because it's what allowed scholars to be able to read the ancient languages. Because it, it's a de decree from one of the Ptolemy kings, um, it's a new law that was, was going out, and they erected this stone and it could be read in three languages. In the top, there was Egyptian hieroglyph. In the middle, there was Coptic script, which was the um, common language of the Egyptians at that time. And underneath was Greek, because they were descended from the Greeks. Now, that's very um, useful, because we understand Greek. We can still read Greek. And they used the Greek to translate the Coptic and the hieroglyph, and then they used the hieroglyph to translate cuneiform, which is the really ancient language um, that you can see on the very old tablets. So it was almost the key, this Rosetta Stone, that unlocked ancient languages, a very, very important discovery. And we can see, and you might not be able to see, but I can see on the left-hand side on that Egyptian um, inscription there, that's from Karnak, there's the names of two pharaohs with those cartouches around them. Um, and that's something that you always look for when you're looking at something from Egypt and you know if it's royalty or involved because there's a cartouche around the name. Okay, right, we're going to take quite a leap forward in, in Bible times now to um, a man that you probably um, won't have heard of, King Taharka. Anyone? No, okay. Well, if we look to 2 Kings chapter 19. <coughs> so we've moved on hundreds of years now from the time of people coming into the land. They've now had a few hundred years of different kings. And one of those kings was Hezekiah. And in the time of Hezekiah, the Assyrians wage war against Israel. Um, and there's a lot of information in, in the books of Kings and Chronicles about what was going on around them. And it's in one of these that we find, I think, quite an incredible little link. So 2 Kings 19, and we'll begin in verse 8. So Rabshakeh, um, who was an Assyrian, and was on behalf of the Assyrians, returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. Now, Lachish, uh, there's a whole room devoted to the siege of Lachish, which is what's being alluded to here. Um, the Assyrians besieged Lachish uh, brutally and took that city, and, and that's what the Jews thought was going to happen to Jerusalem. And he heard say in verse 9 of Teharka, king of Ethiopia. Behold, he is come out to fight against thee. So it's just a footnote, really, or there's these things going on. So you've got Rabshakeh going back to Assyria. The Assyrians have been besieging Lachish. We've got a room that depicts that siege. 
mentioned here in Second Kings. There's a whole room in the British Museum about that one sentence. Then we go on to hear of this King Taharka of Ethiopia. Now in the British Museum we have, again this is in that main room downstairs with all the big sculptures of Egypt. He's in the Egyptian room. So has the Bible got it wrong? Because he was a pharaoh, Taharka. But no, Taharka was a Nubian pharaoh. Now you may not know what that is. The uh, ancient Egypt uh, covered a much larger area than Egypt that we know of now. And it went all the way down into what we would now know as Ethiopia. And there are times in the history of Egypt where the pharaoh came from the north, and there were times when he came from the south, when he was a Nubian pharaoh. And you can tell which one's which because on the headdress that they are usually depicted wearing, there's a single serpent for a king from the north and a double serpent for a Nubian king. And you won't be able to see it, but here, um, this depiction of um, King Taharka, who's being protected by Ra, who was their primary god, in the form of a ram, is there with two serpents, which basically says he was Ethiopian. So the Bible is not wrong, it's incredibly detailed. Um, and I found these kind of very small footnote things more compelling than some of the big things. Okay, moving on again in the time of the kings. Um, we, we read quite a lot in, in the time of the kings um, of nations that were around Israel that warred against Israel at the time of the judges and the time of the kings. Um, Philistines are probably some of the most well known. Um, it's usually a derogatory term now, you Philistine, uh, meaning an uncultured person, but it seems they weren't. Um, there's a whole um, area of the exhibition there that has um, pottery, um, some uh, sarcophagus uh, covers, so the tops of tombs. And again, you might be able to see some of those hanging up on the right hand side. Again, quite intricate and, and detailed and artistic. And these were all from the Philistines. Similarly, we read of the Hittites. And again, we've got things from the Hittite nation in the British Museum. So again, all of these nations that we don't read about anywhere else these things have been discovered to show that these nations existed. These details, these footnotes in the Bible, were real people, were real nations, linked to real events. Okay, move on as quickly as we can now. Um, turn over to Isaiah 22. Um, this is what's known as the Shedna inscription. Now, there's a, a little bit of guesswork that goes into this one. Um, and actually the Bible helps to decode who this is likely to be. It was an inscription found in Jerusalem over a tomb. Um, and it's thought to be the tomb of Shedna the scribe, who we read about in Isaiah. Now Shedna the scribe wasn't a great chap. He abused his position in the temple to make himself rich. And he was roundly condemned by God through the prophet Isaiah. And he was held up as almost an example of all that had gone wrong with Israel. Now, the reason there's a bit of a, a problem with this is that great big hole that you might be able to see is right where the name of the individual is, that this inscription was over the door of the tomb. And it reads, this is the tomb of Yahu, who is over the house there is no silver and gold here, only his bones and the bones of his maidservant with him. Cursed be the man who opens this. It's quite an interesting inscription, isn't it? Obviously someone who was a bit protective of his wealth, do you think? Didn't fancy being plundered. Now what do we read of Shedna, the scribe? Isaiah 22 and verse 15. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, go get thee to this treasurer, Okay, so he was over the house, that's the treasurer's position, 
Go get thee unto this treasure, even to Shedna, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here, and whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulchre here, as he that heweth him out a sepulchre on high, and that graveth a habitation for himself in the rock? Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, and will surely cover thee. And guess what? The tomb was empty. Now, again, we have a couple of links that we've got to make. It's not as obvious as some of the things, but again, nonetheless, I feel quite interested. Again, moving on from that, again, stone and Shedna, there's another seal, this time a seal that would have been possibly in second to a ring, been used to seal official documents, and it reads, Shedna, the son of Ahab. Now, we don't read in the Bible who his father was, but we know Ahab was a king that predates this and was a name that was used at the time. So it might not be the Shedna, but it might be. And again, these little bits and pieces that pick up from the Bible. Okay, on to the, the last couple now. Uh, and this is a very well-known one again. Again, in that main room with lots of the big exhibits, the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser. Um, it's a very impressive object, and um, it stands about this high, um, and you can get very close to it, you can see the real detail of this. Um, and it's of Shalmaneser, who's an Assyrian king, and it's showing um, five nations bringing uh, gifts to the king. And that's what they did. Uh, we were told about things like this in the Bible where a king was becoming powerful, you wanted to gain favour, you went and offered him some gifts, hoping that those gifts would get you into his good books and he wouldn't come and try and destroy you. Um, it's tactics that probably haven't changed much over the years. So this one is, is Shalmaneza, and it actually shows um, the trials after, and we don't really have time to look at it, but 2 Kings 8, if you wanted to look at it, um, 2 Kings 8 details the defeat of Ben-Hadad of Syria, who was the other big power at the time. So Shalmaneser defeats Ben-Hadad, and all the other nations look and go, well, okay, Shalmaneser, he's the most powerful guy, we better go and try and carry favour with him. The second row down, okay, we can now read this, this is written in cuneiform, and because of the Rosetta Stone, we can now actually read what it says. It says, Tribute of Jehu, son of Omri. Now we read of Jehu in the Bible. I received silver, gold, a golden bowl, a golden vase with a pointed bottom, golden tumblers, golden buckets, tin, a staff for a king, and spears. And there's an actual depiction of Jehu kneeling down in front of Shalmaneser. And it's the only known image of an Israelite king. And again, people had maybe begun to doubt that this nation had existed, that these kings had existed. And up pops, in 1845, this one, the obelisk of Shalmaneser, that gives the name of Jehu, son of Omri. Again, this is Shalmaneser um, from his palace. Um, there was uh, a huge and impressive gate, you can see on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side, and this really is enormous, it's taller than this room, um, and it's a huge imposing stele of uh, a picture of the king, but it's absolutely covered in cuneiform on every surface, top, bottom, sides, back, everywhere, and it's a record of his life. It is likely to have been part of the dedication at his funeral, and it details all of his military triumphs and all the things that he did as a king. And it mentions both Ahab and Jehu, kings of Israel. So again, people that we read about in the Bible, we see their names on these things in the British Museum. So just to finish, we come back to where we started which is faith. We've got all these things, and we could go on for so long, I probably have done already, um, but we could go on for so much longer looking at more and more things that give these links to things that we can read in the Bible. 
But that's not really the point. Because these things, I believe, only exist for one reason. And it's so that we might have faith. If we've got evidence like this to show that the Bible is true, to show that it's accurate, it might actually make us want to read it. And that's what God wants. He wants us to read it. And he says in Hebrews 11, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now here are things that we can see, but they can give us the basis to believe the things that we can't see. And that's what God wants of us. He wants us to read his word, to have faith in it, to believe it, and to see that it is true. And all of these things, I believe, only exist so that they might bring us to read the Bible itself. And that's the plea I leave, really, is as interesting as it is looking at these things that you can find in the British Museum, it's much more important to read the Bible itself. Thank you.